Here I am in the Lori Taylor room. Right. Really? Quite the surprise. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. So, oh, you look around here and the pictures, the maps, those are all stuff. Not only you probably took the pictures, but you probably certainly put up the maps and everything else. I put everything up. The, the pictures were taken by a professional photographer back. Boy, I think it was Don Burdick's days. Well, it's remarkable. It's just for, for a little quite a bit, bit biography. Talk to me about a little bit about your dad, Bill Taylor. Well, he... What was it? A little bit about his bio background. He was in the, well, in the Navy. He uh, went into his father's business, Jamestown Table Company at the time. And then about the time I graduated, or just before I graduated from high school in 1972, turned into Taylor Jamestown Corporation with my uncles. Uh, my father, he was vice president treasurer. Uh, then, well, I, t I take that back. It was in the 60s that it became Taylor Jamestown. And then in the year I graduated, 1972, they sold the business to Ethan Allen. And from there, he went on and became a partner in B&E Electric mm. with Marsh Carlson. And was there for Oh boy, I was in the Navy, so it was into the 80s, early 80s. And then that basically just went out of business. Funny, I bring that up. I, I, I remember those. I did. I forgot your dad was at B&E. Uh, he was a Navy guy, right? Yes. Uh, As a matter of fact, he was uh, when they had the opening of Forever Darling with Lucille Ball. He was one of the Navy officers that escorted her down Third Street. Did you ever talk about that? Yeah, we had pictures in the house, you know, a couple of them. But no, he he really didn't. Probably because we maybe asked when we were little kids, but I don't remember. Uh, as far as your mother, what did she did she do anything, or she was a housewife? She was housewife. Yeah. Yeah. What was her name? Virginia. Virginia. Ginger. Uh, I remember the back of my name, uh, somebody named Buffy Taylor. Who was that? That was my aunt. That was my brother, or my dad's brother, Frank's wife. Gotcha. Check Buffy out. Garrett. Uh, I think I've told you the story uh, about the time your dad literally saved me. Uh, it was the 19, the blizzard of 1977. And I was going to pick up Cindy, uh, who was driving in from Buffalo Law School. She got as far as ceases. Remember that? On the throughway. On the yeah. throughway. And, uh, you know, there was no cell phone, so we didn't know what was going on. I got to Aldrich's Dairy. Okay. That's as far as I could go drifting. And they finally opened up enough so that I could get to the hotel. Uh, the Holiday Inn Hotel on Route 60. And I walk in as if I'm going to get a room, and there, of course, no rooms whatsoever. <laughs> so I resigned myself to sleep on a couch, you know, because you got my fiance, you know, 15 miles away, but stuck. And your dad, Greg, what are you doing here? Just so gracious. And the next thing you know, he not only bought my dinner, let me sleep in his, that he had two beds in there, and uh, uh, I'll never forget that, that your dad was so wonderful. That was his style. Yeah, it was. It sounds like dad. And uh, my dad, my dad would always, Lyle would always talk about your dad, always did the right things. You know, if there was a group of people and somebody needed to get up and thank the presenter or, you know, you kind of, that group awkwardness where, Somebody had to do the right thing, and it was always your dad. So I, I, those are things, my memories of, of your dad on many fronts. Uh, the Navy, so your dad was in the Navy, was that World War II? Yes. He was never overseas. He was uh, basically, he was a Supply Corps officer. So he was, from what I remember, in Chicago most of the time with my mom. Yep. 
And was that natural then for you to get into the Navy? Was that? That, he always used to take us to drills, my brother and I, uh, on Tuesday nights when we had the Naval Reserve Center up on Hazel Time. And I don't know if that had a, something to do with it. I guess I, I knew I always thought about going in the military at some point. And at that time, I wasn't eligible for the draft. And just as I became eligible, turned 18, the uh, Vietnam was winding down and so was the draft. And so I went to college and graduated in 1980 and actually was, went to see the officer recruiter up in Buffalo to try to get into the healthcare administration field. And uh, that's, that's how that started. So you went to, where'd you go to college? Fredonia. Fredonia? Yeah. So from Fredonia, then you went up to the, uh, uh, the recruiters and? And then to OCS in Newport, Rhode Island, and then into the regular Navy. Did your brother do the same thing, Steve? He, well, he was, I believe he was drafted during the Vietnam era, and he was in, uh, he was on the USS Manly uh, as a, an enlisted man. Um, I don't, his rate was storekeeper, so he sort of followed in my dad's footsteps in that respect. Uh, and then he, he got out and went to uh, the reserve center here in Jamestown as well. Then as far as siblings, you also have a younger brother, right? No, I'm the youngest. You're the youngest? Yep, yeah, I'm Billy. the baby. B then Bill, and then Nancy, well, then Steve, Nancy, and Diane. Okay, gotcha. So the five of you. Yes. Uh, so what did you get out of the Navy, then kind of what's your work history? Once I got out of the Navy, I came back to Jamestown, uh, interviewed with uh, some national companies with uh, headhunters just coming out of the Navy in Atlanta and Philadelphia, up in Boston, and uh, was offered one job with PepsiCo. But I, that would be in Philadelphia. And I was close to taking that, but then my parents were aging at the time, so I decided <coughs> to come back to Jamestown. Yeah. What was your first entry point here in Jamestown? Well, actually, I applied to become, at the time, John Glenzer was the county executive, and I applied to, uh, there was an opening at the Private Industry Council. Hmm. And Jane Cleaver ended up, obviously, getting that job. But uh, John Glenzer steered me towards the IDA. And then I interviewed with David and, uh, Paul Sandberg at the town club and was basically hired on the spot. What was your job description? At, back then I was a project coordinator. Mm -hmm. And back then, it, IDA employees were county employees. So I basically worked in my job before they came up with the civil service exam for project coordinator. I was like at my job for two and a half years. And then you had to score in the top three, you know, to, uh, to be successful or somebody else could, you know, take it out from under you. So that was sort of nerve wracking, but I placed number two, so I was, I was fine. But, but there are people in the county system that take every test that comes up and the number one person, you know, was a guy that that did this, but he just would never have fit, you know, into the the role as a project coordinator with the IDA. So, 1980 was really your start time here with the IDA. 1985, February of 85. February of 85. So, tell me, what, what was the staff? Uh, what, what did it consist of at the time? At that time, it was David, 
uh, receptionist Melanie Dearborn, George Moore, who was the assistant director, and a consultant, Tom Duro. Ah, Tom. Uh, yeah. And, and the chairman of the board at the time was Paul Sandberg. Paul Sandberg. Do you remember some of the other board members that when you got there? Tom Reed uh, was on the board. John Cook was on the board. Chuck? Chuck Turkow was on the board, yes. Um, boy. Back then, we, I think we just had seven board members. Rocco Duino was on the board. How many is that? You're keeping track. <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting close. Uh, and that's all. I, I, I've got a history of the board that I've been keeping down in my office on my computer. So at that time, in 1985, done. the board uh, consisted of essentially industrialists. There probably was also maybe Paul Benke might have been on there or something. It was wasn't there. Paul Benke. It was uh, Don McPhee. Don McPhee. Yep. So there was an act, there was the, the the mix was basically industrialist plus the chamber plus uh, somebody from academia. Correct. Uh, at the time, I don't think there was anybody who was the, the charter was such that somebody from the legislature was on. I think that came later. True. Correct. Uh, and the attorney that, at that time was. Uh, was Jim, oh, Jim Summer. Jim Summer. Yep. Would you have any recollections of Jim? Just what a gentleman, you know, he was. Uh, I know when he he left the agency and you took over, obviously, uh, he sent me a book, you know, that I still have to this day and read every once in a while. And the history of Chautauqua County, it's, I think it's a green book. Yes, yep. I remember that dinner because it was sort of a, my formal introduction to that process and uh, Jim would not, he was so reticent about being recognized. I mean he deflected everything. Oh yeah, yep. He was definitely behind the scenes type of guy. Yeah. Uh, was there much, when you again, when you got started in 1985 and 86, 7 time period, you know, David being the administrative director, it. The decision makings behind the scene. Who were the real decision makers? Paul and, and David, and and John Glenzer, at the time. So, I know that the board was active and good, but uh, essentially there were always the guys that cut the deals. Pretty much in the, I mean, Paul I think communicated a lot, you know, with the board behind the scenes, but to get the the ball rolling it was David and, and Paul mostly. Talk a little bit about David's style. David as a uh, he held a couple of positions uh, privately and publicly but he had a, he had a, 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 a salesman type approach towards it. Dave that, well I know he was just going through the history of the IDA was more detailed when he had to be. But when he started to get a staff, he basically left the details to me and George, mm -hmm. you know, to ham out. He'd come up with a concept and then give it to us to run with. And uh, he was very, basically hands off. You know, he'd just give us a task and we'd go at it and, and uh, hopefully bring it to fruition. What was his relationship like with the New York State Development Authority and those guys? He and Bob Dormer, who was president of the Job Development Authority at the time, they had a very close relationship. And uh, at that time, the Altec Fund was administered through the New York Job Development Authority. Uh, so he, David was in New York a lot. Uh, uh, Bob Dormer was up here in Chautauqua County a lot, um, and his staff. That, 
I don't want to get into some of the nitty gritty of, of things that happened there, but uh, eventually it was turned over basically when Bill Daly came on board. Uh, we had been working on it before then to have the fund transferred to our control. And then once Bill got here and Rich got here, it, we were successful. All the uh, loans were transferred for our administration. The Altec Trust Fund uh, had been created prior to when you got here and it was servicing two counties, Albany County and Chautauqua County. Uh, was there a, uh, I'm trying to also think of the attorney who was involved with the JDA, older guy at the time. Uh, uh, McLaughlin. McLaughlin. Yeah. You know, he was the Can't other was, key piece. Yeah, yeah, he was. Uh, Ken McLaughlin. Ken, oh my yeah. gosh. You're good. So Ken McLaughlin, because we, uh, we we got involved, and it was kind of crazy. They would actually fly out here for a hundred thousand dollar loan, and it was strange. David was the administrative director here. That was the title until when? You remember the till kind of ironic or comical. He had he had put in for his retirement from the IDA from the county he made a mathematical error one year in advance of when he was eligible for his 20 years <laughs> to retire. So he came back for a year. So I think it was 1993 that he, he finally left the agency. So David left the agency. Was there a succession planning at the time? No. Uh, we had worked closely with Don Burdick uh, through Sonny Fredoni, his role there, and I can't recall if he was sort of the heir apparent uh, at the time. He never, he, although he worked with us on several projects, he, you know, ended up being Dave's successor. What was his style like? He was very hands-on, just the opposite of David. Because obviously David had Dawson Metal, you know, that he was uh, working with uh, and handling, you know, the IDA. But uh, Don Burdick was much more hands-on in the office a lot more, uh, didn't do the, the traveling to businesses and to New York that David had done. We got to talk a little bit, or at least I, hopefully you can share a little bit of reflection. That during that time, I, I get involved, uh, taking over for Jim, uh, David, George, you. David had a secretary whose name I have just drawn a blank on um, at the IDA. Sander. Sandra Johnson. Yep. Thank you. It was Sandra Okerlund, and then she married while she was working here. She was very, she was very much part of that. Oh yeah. At the time. Yep. And I think that was pretty much the cadre of people. It was David, Sandy, you, George, and location-wise, I believe you're still at the hotel. Yes. Where where were you at the hotel? Do you remember the address? Room six hundred on the sixth floor. Um, and did, what, what other offices were nearby there? Were there law offices? Were there Ed Fagan's office was right down the hall, uh, which there, every once in a while we could hear some commotion over there uh, <laughs> with his clients. Uh, and that, that was basically it for law offices. Right. And then the hotel, which was operated by Milt Battler. Correct. And, his and Bruce. Bruce. Yeah. Uh, then what was it that led to us moving out of there? Well, shortly after I got there, because I was totally gung-ho on redeveloping 
things. Uh, Fraser Furniture went bottoms up, and we took back the building, the old Crescent Tool building at uh, Harrison and Foot was basically abandoned. So I took it upon myself to board up, the, have the windows boarded up, with Dave's consent, obviously, because it was costing money. And then I, at the time, incubators were coming into fashion, and I had done a lot of reading about it and went after some grant funds along in partnership with the city to sort of redevelop that section of the city and uh, was successful in getting ARC grants, two of them, and uh, basically rehabbed the building in, that was 1987, that uh, the private industry council was the first major tenant uh, Jamestown Lock was an incubator tenant, um, and then I, I think it was a mutual thinking between Dave and I that I was spending so much time down there. I either have an office down there, and then lo and behold, you know, we came up with the Bob Lund, the architect, came up with the design and we moved on the first floor on the corner uh, in the fall of 1987. A long uh, uh, foot avenue? Correct, okay. yep. Kind of a long, narrow area. Yes, particular. yep. Was that a, a comfortable spot for you guys? I mean, was that a move, a move to the hotel down there? Was that deemed out of necessity? because you own the building, or is that really deemed an upgrade for you? Well, and on an upgrade, uh, we, basically the hotel being on the sixth floor, you know, we were, parking was an issue. Uh, this, since we were developing the building, and we had some, well, the private industry council in there, uh, the Western New York uh, Technology Development Center was looking for a place at the time. And along with the incubator concept, we figured, you know, we'll try to make this a one-stop shop where you could go into the building, meet with us for financing, uh, meet with the TDC for technical assistance, and uh, possibly become a tenant in the building. And Pick was there too. The Thank Private you. Industry Council, yeah, they were the first office tenant. And they were there for a long time. The, yeah, they were there right up until they basically dissolved. Right. Because then J after Jane, then uh, for a period, a little short period of time, was it, was it Lou? Was it Lou De Palma? Uh, who was the guy that sort of ran it after Jane? I'm trying to think, was Chuck Fior Fiorella? It might have been a little. But I remember the actual meeting when they dissolved. But the, yeah, because it wasn't too long after Jane left. She must have seen the handwriting on the wall that the the uh, program, federal program, disappeared and transitioned into a different, basically, the Workforce Investment Board. So as I recall, Fraser Furniture. Uh, I forget that whether the. Uh, whether we took title from Fraser or it came from the JDA foreclosing, but we ultimately assumed that debt. Correct. Uh, and so the Chautauqua Region Industrial Development Corporation at the time, critic, took title. And I'm trying to think whether we, that was because we had got funding that was required to be a separate entity. Do you recall? No. Uh Basically, again, David and, and Bob Dormer's uh, closeness or uh, partnership, we started to loan or get, get money from the Altec Fund, since it was an Altec loan, to sort of resurrect this. So right. the IDA was, was basically borrowing money from its own fund 
which we found out was not the good thing to do. Yeah, it, uh, yeah there was, I don't think anybody thought that it's illegal, but no. it was a kind of a conflict of interest. Correct, correct. Borrowing to yourself, uh, which is now paid off. I want the camera to know that it's sold yeah. and we're completely paid off. Uh, but that became your creepy, <coughs> Laurie. I mean, if anything, uh, we got a plaque here in this boardroom, but if anybody <laughs> needed a plaque, it would be on that building. What was this? What was the kind of overarching speed bump on the building? Just an old industrial site? Well, it, it, you mean for our transition from there to here? No, well, no, no, no. I'm talking about the building itself. Because you, I mean, in 87, uh -huh. you sort of became the, the first caretaker of the building and literally, right? Today, even yeah, to, uh, talk to the Alan Steinberg about it, but that that's a that's a Lori Taylor project if there ever was one. Well, we uh, basically our problem was we we had the building sold at one point in time to Adolf Miranda at Metal Tech. Mm -hmm. He had the option to purchase and was working toward that. Uh, so. Basically, we lost control of the building. He was no good. He, we were still negotiating the leases for him for office space, but he basically ran wild. He just started in there, and he had about seven thousand square feet. And then by the time he left, he had the entire, basically non-office part of the building, the factory part of the building. And uh, then he sold it to Royce Eisenhower, or I, Eisenhower, or something yeah, that's like true, that. Yeah. And whereas Adolf would lay people off if business were tapering off, and then rehire them back, Royce just kept producing, producing, producing. And, uh, you know, there was stock unsold inventory and stock all over the building. And that's what led to his demise. And then basically, I believe it happened through auction that uh, the Hedman family from Warren, Pennsylvania came in and, and took over. And renamed it uh, National Wire Metal Products. My gosh, that's right. And they were there really up until they bought a facility here in Don Allen. Correct. Right? They bought part of the old Dal or, uh, Blackstone facility down on T well, Tiffany and Carolina, I think, the, between the two. And to draw, and, go ahead. And rehab that. And to just draw closure to that story, that building is uh, now owned by. Alan Steinberg, 201 Harrison, or 200 Harrison LLC, I believe. Uh, we also, across, we bought that site parking lot across the street. Yes, that was, well, actually we still own that, 201 Harrison LLC, uh, which is like a 150 car parking lot. So that was one of the main attractions of the building. And because they're uh, back, f uh, well, those, those parking lots were developed the same time we were developing uh, the Riverside Business Center. And now is leased, long-term lease, with an option to purchase to Allen. Correct. You become kind of the project manager, but in many senses, the go-to guy at the IDA for facilities. Yeah. Uh, what have been some of the crazy stories, uh, uh, birds in buildings, and all that stuff that you can talk about or remember? Well, the one that really sticks in my mind, because it happened more than once, and I told him not to use the elevator if nobody else is in the building is Rich Dixon would get to the office like at 5.30 in the morning. And it'd be in the winter typically, and the hydraulic fluid in the elevator would not be quite up to temperature, and he'd get in the elevator, and next thing I know I'm getting a call that he's in the elevator stuck, you know, and 
I'd run down and <laughs> let him out, try to get him out. He never had that, to climb out, did he? No, no. I always brought it down. I knew how to get it down to the first floor. <laughs> so. Aye, aye, aye. Uh, you've also, Talcott Street and other places you've been kind of the caretaker of? Yeah, yeah. Any crazy stories there? No, mostly nuisance things like alarms, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, that after a while, you know, if you have to worry about them or just let them go until morning and call somebody or check it out then. But uh, Back to people you've worked for. Uh, we got to Don Burdick and his style. Uh, then... Don was uh, in a kind of a political uh, gymnastics, probably uh, uh, did, did not continue on, and, and they had an interim for there for a period of time. Richard Schubon. Right. Yeah, when Mark Thomas came in and Andrew Dell, as county executive, left, Don was out almost immediately. I don't know. Because Don didn't seem as political as David seemed to me, but uh, you know they just Mark and Don, I guess, just didn't see eye to eye. And Dick Schubon was in for probably about seven months, seven or eight months, and then Rich Alexander came on board. What was Rich's style? Sort of a mix, sort more like David. He was sort of, you know, hands off. He'd give you, a, you know, an assignment. But then he brought in a, an assistant, Sherry Bauer, who was more like his. Well, for us, like a lightning rod, but. Uh, She's the one that cracked the whip in the office. Mm -hmm. In what sense was she a lightning rod? She just, well, internally within the staff, because the staff was growing at that time, there were more people in the office. Uh, nobody, she really didn't know what she was talking about. You know, she just saw an end result. She didn't know the process that anything had to go through. And uh, just unreasonable, you know, in her expectations, you know, with what we could do. Was that also the time where your offices, did that change down there? We moved from the first no, we moved from the first floor to the second floor when uh, Don Burdick was still there. Okay. The staff was increasing. And then, but when we kept moving on up, uh, when Rich and uh, uh, Sherry were there, we moved up to the third floor. Was that also the time, they talk about staff increasing, who else, who was, it, who was added during those time periods? Do you remember some of the names? Oh boy, Annette Drummond, Ruth Sisson, uh, Nancy Petrocello, Nancy Honey Petrocello. Um, Carol came on about that time. George was still there. George was still there. George left or retired when Bill Daly got to uh, the IDA. And that's, and Ruth, uh, or not Ruth, uh, Rose, Whiteman, Rose Whiteman, who was basically, she was not in our office at the time, but around that time, she was with DPF and was handling our projects down there. Because at the time we were doing a lot of expansion uh, with the industrial parks, uh, putting up spec buildings, 
this was during Mark Thomas's reign. Uh, and then Rose finally, actually when Sherry left, Rose came into our office and assumed her duties as the assistant director. And Rose, was this part of the group that some of the names you just added, I don't know, from Nancy to Ruth to, to Rose, were they part of the IDA or were they part of the county planning department? <laughs> that time it was transitioning the IDA was starting to hire their own employees the only at that point in time it was just George myself Nancy Honey Petrocelli that were county employees okay. and, and obviously rich you know which is still true today they're part county part IDA Without getting into a lot of detail, but during that time when, when Rich was there uh, and Sherry, you know, we had a visit from the FBI. What was that like in the office? Did, I mean, I just, uh, I was on the outside, very much on the outside looking in at that time, but what was it like kind of? Uh, well, well it'll, it'll tell you a funny story. I was the last one getting to the office that morning and I got off the elevator on the third floor and there was this guy standing outside the elevator said are you Lawrence Taylor and I said yes and I said he showed me his badge his FBI badge and he said can you follow me and I thought oh god what have I done <laughs> and then he took took us to the boardroom or took me to the boardroom and opened the door and everybody else is staying there and I just went like, whoa. <laughs> and then it was, it was a strange day. I think one thing we didn't do was, you know, get a hold of you immediately. I think, no, Rich was on his way to Buffalo. Yeah, he was. Were you in town? Or? Yeah, I was no. in town. Oh, okay. Yeah, we got, you know, people involved, yeah. But, uh, yeah, they wouldn't let us make any phone calls, wouldn't let us even go to our offices uh, because they had a whole crew in there that was, you know, picking up records, taking hard drives out of computers and, and that sort of thing. So it was an interesting day. And then they interviewed us, obviously. I assume they were all separate interviews. And what was the... Correct. I assume, obviously you can't ever anticipate that happening, but uh, when the day was done, what was the morale like in the office? I think, well, after the initial shock and surprise, we, everybody was speculating who and what they were after. And I think we were sort of relieved <laughs> that you know, somebody's finally looking into it. Yeah. I won't mention any names, but uh, yeah. I think the outcome, you know, uh, stated the facts. Yeah. Uh, we got, uh, did you guys have subsequent interviews with Terry Connor? Terry was the attorney we brought in representing the idea. I don't know if that got to that level. Uh, no. Well, I didn't, personally. I don't know that anybody else in the office did either. Uh, we, because the, to represent the IDA, which was our job, not Rich, not anybody else, but uh, that's how that worked out. So, that chapter ultimately concluded and there was no action against Rich or Sherry on that action and we got the files back Eventually, I remember going yeah. to our friends at the FBI saying, can we get files back? <laughs> Which we did. Uh, then entered the Bill Daly era. Uh, what Did you know Bill beforehand, before he came to the IDA? He was a, a friend of oh, brothers and sisters. You know, I didn't know him as well as, as other siblings did, but... And, and Bill was here for uh, about eight years. Eight years. What was his uh, style? Bill was a real go-getter. 
I mean, he was definitely hands-on. He was very definitely the point person. And that's where the successful combination of Rich and Bill, I mean, they were inseparable. They were on the road together uh, and brought in a lot of great projects. Now, Rich had come from the public and private sector here. Was uh, He was an employee, he was brought in by Bill, right? Correct. Uh, did you know Rich before then? Through the I, pick or anything else? Yeah, I knew Rich because he was the business manager or uh, director of business operations for the Private Industry Council when they originally came to the building. And Bill, uh, now, now for the camera, is that he's the head of the economic development in Wyoming County. Uh, he had a gregarious, very outward, you know, movement. Did, did that project itself in the office too? Oh yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> but he was the type of person, he'd do it in a fun way, but if you want something done, you better get it done, you know? not wait or put it on the back burner. You know, he was one to prioritize, you know, things. That then after Bill came Kevin. Correct. And, and Kevin Sandwich. And what was his style like? Kevin was, at that point in time, because I heard Kevin say it once, the, uh, Rich was a CFO, obviously, still. And, uh, you know, Kevin mentioned, you know, that he was also the operating officer. And th that's pretty much the way it was. Uh, Kevin was spending time between the office in Fredonia, the Fredonia Incubator, and here in Jamestown. So Rich was the day-to-day, -day, you know, basically chief operating officer. Mm -hmm. And still is. At what yep. point did the uh, integration of offices uh, with the Department of Planning, when did that occur where they were kind of all under one roof? That happened towards the end of Rich Alexander's time. They moved into the Riverside building with us. Uh, we expanded our office, obviously had to, and uh, they've been with us ever since. Uh, from your perspective, uh, this has not always been uh, a, a political uh, oasis. I mean, politics have, have, have reared its head in various parts. Uh, do you get a perception of kind of when that might have started? We're not, I, I must tell the camera, and I'm sure Lori will agree, at no point. So I believe the board of the IDA is political. I don't believe any actions, uh, this is an editorial, but uh, I believe it very strongly that no decisions that I can recall in all my years really were politically, uh, uh, where that got brought into the process. It was really strange. But from the outside, externally, uh, did you get a sense of, of kind of how all of a sudden we became Conversation. I I say that where I saw politics starting to develop, they didn't exist when between David Dawson, John Glenzer, Andrew Goodell. The first time I started to see it was when Mark Thomas and Rich Alexander came in to play. That and it was kind of a shock and an eye opener. Uh, pretty much the existing board, with the few exceptions, Tom Reed stayed on, uh, people just resigned in mass. You know, I don't know if that was out of courtesy so Mark could appoint his own board members. Uh, but Tom Reed did stay on. Chuck Turcott, I believe, stayed on. I'd have to look at my my sheet, but that's when I first saw politics between the director 
and the county executive, you know, enter into it. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't so much so when Bill Daly and Greg uh, Edwards were in there, or it really hasn't been since. I think the directors have always wanted to please the county executive, obviously, because they, they serve at his discretion. Uh, but uh, so you might see some politics there exerted by, you know, the director to get something accomplished. But uh, I'd say that the most political time was. Uh, Mark Thomas, Rich Alexander's time. Did that impact itself on the staff? You know, oh, clearly? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Just because, you know, we're working with business, trying to do what's best for them, not looking at, you know, what uh, the county executive wants or thinks or uh, that sort of thing. And the other thing, you know, with every county executive going right up through, well, Vince Horgan, uh, is there's a learning curve, you know, for economic development. You know, things don't just happen overnight. And you can't broadcast stuff uh, the way some people, you know, want. Everybody wants to give good news, but, you know, there's some stuff that's confidential that you just can't say and you've just got to be patient and work through it, you know, instead of just always having a splash on the front page of the paper. As you, you're in, uh, retiring after a glorious run yeah. here at the IDA, is, is there a message to your next project manager or to the Mark guys saying, based on my years of experience and I've been in the trenches and dealt with, you've dealt with everybody, uh, kind of a message uh, that you would you would give to somebody like that? It's just something very simple, you know, which I just sort of went over is be patient, be attentive, and you know, things just don't happen overnight and try to stay political. Again, as you reflect back on all your years, is there something you say, Greg, let me tell you, this is really funny, what happened to the IDA, about the IDA, maybe to you, maybe to one of your fellow colleagues here, kind of a humorous, crazy incident or two, you'd say, this is one which we either were embarrassed about or got you know, caught and I can laugh at it now. I... I guess I'd say the the one thing that stick well, there are probably three things that stick in my mind. One is you know David because he was sort of my mentor when I got here, and he was so hands off. He's a terrific boss, but that he one miscalculated his retirement, <laughs> you know, <laughs> by a year and uh, came back and. Uh, the other thing, I don't know, you, we went through the one FBI investigation, but I also went through an FBI investigation for David uh, back in the early days. Bush Industries? Bush, yeah, with the Altec oh. uh, connection again. But both, you know, came out fine. And it wasn't, the first one wasn't the Gestapo tactics that led that we had during the Alexander uh, Bauer investigation but it you know they were in there they asked questions but they didn't come in and you know keep us from our offices or telephones or anything yeah, yeah. much more discreet Gosh, I forgot about that but I uh, I remember the study that, that the all tech the, the, a law firm came in they did right. the study Kevin over and Cook. Oh my gosh. That the, uh, yeah, well, getting away from the, the highlights, but yeah, that was a big deal too when uh, 
basically it involved the county controller because, and that was politics at its worst. You know, the county controller thought they had jurisdiction over our books and they didn't. And well, it wasn't, they actually you can probably answer this better, but was it Andrew that came up with sort of the board materials that explained it to the legislature and to everybody, the difference between the IDA and the County Department of Economic Development and Planning. Steve, Ab Steve Abdella prepared a memo at my encouragement, but he okay. did a fantastic job, which is the Holy Grail. Right. That, to this day. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, explaining what the differences, and yes, I remember that so distinctly, the Kavanoke Cook, uh, and ironically of the 103, four loans they looked at, there were really just three that were suspect, and that's lost on everybody. Yeah, Afro Lee Khan, Groblin, and... One other one was sort of, I forget now, but it was, uh, anyways, yeah, it looked, but those are the two big ones, Afro Lee Khan and Roblin, and both uh, had extenuating circumstances. So, to me, the Kavanoke Cook report cleansed the process. And they only focused really on those two. Roblin was designed, we all knew it was a stretch. Oh, yeah. Every, the, if you get read the minutes, it was a stretch, made no sense. But Roblin might live for another day. It did save money, employees for another two or three years. No banker would do it, but we did it. And Afro Lecon was had extenuating circumstances, nothing criminal, nothing untoward, all with an intent to assist a minority business. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's got all the headlines, uh, unfortunately. And then enter Bill Parment, and the good news, I guess they they restocked the money. Yeah, Bill. Bill was the one that got New York State because, well, at the same time. New York Job Development Authority, Bob Dormer was lending, basically using the Altec pot of money for other uses, not in Albany or, or Chautauqua counties. And that's the way it was back then. You know, uh, but yeah, that's, glad we're through that, you know. Well, and when the day was done, uh, through that investigation, especially that part, which didn't have anything to do with us, the IDA, directly, but kind of exposed a practice, which put the JDA in the highlight, right. which then led to the state restocking the IDA money, which then led to an opportunity, and I was in the middle of it with Paul Sandberg and uh, ultimately Bill and Rich about getting the funds away from JDA splitting them, and that's what our LTEC fund now, which is a great thing to have here. Oh yeah. It sped up the process, uh, controlling it locally. We still have all the reporting requirements that JDA had to the Economic Development Administration. And uh, it's, for a long time, when it had to go through the JDA process, in the authority control board and everything else, you know, at the state level for a, an Altec loan, banks were just walking away from us because it was taking too long to close these things. You know, it could take up to a year, a year and a half. In the meantime, the customer uh, is paying a higher rate of interest for the bridge loan uh, through the bank, and now we close them fairly fast because everything's handled locally so well congratulations you've done an well, amazing thanks. job uh, and you've uh, worked your way through and, and I, I, I personally uh, applaud not only what you've done because you've been the rock that sort of steady piece for 30 three years yeah three years um, I came in shortly after you got started, so uh, I, I, you brought up names today of people I had forgotten. Maybe that's part of my dotage 
No, I believe. <laughs> like I can't. Wow, how did you come up? Remember those names? Uh, a lot, a lot of fascinating stories uh, along the way. Well, thank you and congratulations and enjoy it. Uh, I trust you'll stop in and give us the uh, straight and narrow. You, you did this history, and. What did you learn from this? What was the what was the walk away? The origination of it all, and kind of how did we get control of it? Well, just the uh, like I said, it was certainly not a competition. David made it out to be between the Farmers Home Administration and uh, Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration, and the EDA. He basically gave a grant. Originally it was going to be a five million dollar loan and a five million dollar grant that uh, would the loan part portion would turn into a revol revolving loan fund. And then at the last minute the entire 10 million was granted uh, to be paid back to the two counties and so, turned into a revolving loan fund for Albany and Chautauqua counties. So essentially the uh, Department of Commerce Economic Development Administration granted ten million dollars which we, when we use the term grant it's not a gift, it's a grant gift to us. Correct. And, and th then we in turn lent it to, to Altec. Altec and then when they paid it back it created this revolving loan fund. Correct. To benefit two counties. Yes. Chautauqua and Albany. Okay. And they 60, did pay it back. Yes, sixty percent was designated for Chautauqua, and forty percent to Albany. And the original administrators of that was who? State Department of Commerce, uh, and they gave it to the responsibility of the Job Development Authority. Got it. And that's who we worked with was the JDA originally. So any things that originated from the IDA would then be submitted to the New York Job Development Authority who in turn would review it, react to it, and then they would administer any loan. Correct. And, and we got involved only as the referral agency, essentially. Yes, yep. Um, and it was recapitalized in 97, and then um, in, I'm trying to think, when, when did we get it, Lori? Do you remember when we, the county of Chautauqua IDA, got it? From JDA, yeah. uh, it's, it was early on in Bill's, uh, Bill Daly's tenure here, so it would have had to have been, what, probably roughly 12 years ago. Okay. And Daly was 2006 to 2014, so to say, let's say 2007, 2008 time period. To sound about right? Yeah, now. yep. Well, yeah, we had the 10th anniversary, <coughs> we had the 40th anniversary of the fund, and I think the 10th anniversary of us administering it. Okay, a couple years, yeah. yeah. Wow. And through those funds, we've had a some some loans that go back. We what we got were files literally went back to 1977. Uh, Chautauqua Hardware Land Purchase from Cooper Industries was the first one, and then the Mizgawa Project. So, uh, but essentially, Chautauqua Hardware uh, Crescent Tool Building, which was the building we ended up being our office. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and Mizgawa, I don't know if, if that was Ed Mizgawa, that used to have Banner, was it? Banner Beverages? Oh gosh. So, is that ironic? I, I never knew that. That really one of the first, if not the first, Altec loan was regarding 
property which we then became our headquarters. And that had to have been the uh, where Urology Associates is, that building. that building. Because that's the only thing, or maybe some vacant land behind it. Mm -hmm. But uh, because there used to be a bridgeway connecting those two across the Shattercoin that uh, I believe was their shipping department back in the day, Crescents. Interesting. Now, you got involved starting really in, in 85. Correct. Uh, and I'm starting to look at the 85 LTEC loans. And do any of those early ones jump out at you as Oh yeah, I remember that one. Uh, I remember these, but I, I'm trying to think of anything that was unusual. Jamestown Shoe Manufacturing, you talked about today. Uh, essentially, we were, well, what was it? We were some bank condescended into really co-opting with them, right? Yes, right. yeah. It, it was First National Bank, and you're talking Jamestown Shoe, yeah. correct? Uh, yeah. And uh, we were hesitant at, since the bank did their due diligence, we went along with it and were paid back in full. Even after they closed their business? Yeah, yeah. It wow. didn't succeed, but they, they ended up honoring their loan. The other one, one of the first ones I remember, uh, because this is probably gives you an idea of the time it took to close was uh, our tone manufacturing. Mm -hmm. and that's when the father, I remember meeting with, oh, I don't, what's the father's name? Calamari. Rosario. Rosario. Rosario Calamari. Yeah, and he was very, that's when the sons, Mike and uh, Sebastian, were wanted to expand the business, but Mr. Calamary was, wanted to do basically cash type deals. And they ended up, you know, taking out a loan and look where they are today. Yep, I remember that. Rosario would not sign a guarantee or anything. Right. And uh, that, that was uh, interesting. As I turn the page, 86. Um, I know there was a couple of Belknap business forms. That was uh, uh, Mr. Belknap and the guy who was the big heavy set guy who was a Belknap business. Wine form. Zero? Wasn't it? Who was it? Wine Zero. Buster Wine Zero. Right. <laughs> Uh, he ran it, for, and Belknap, well, he bought it from Belknap. Buster Weinsroom, gosh. And VSR Continuous was part of them, right below it. Right. And then basically they had that devastating fire, which probably was timely because everything was going to electronic forms by that time, so. Right. DNF Pallet, 1986. And we're still got loans with DNF Pallet. Dahlstrom Manufacturing at the time, that was Craig Colburn, right? Or was it? I, I don't know if Quintus was still. I think it was Craig. And yeah. Hal Bolton, remember Hal had it for a period of time. I if you remember him. Yeah, I do. And then there was another loan to our tone. Then, oh, here's the infamous loan. Uh, Betty Dixon Candies. Mm -hmm. That was the one where, remember we talked earlier today about a bank, bridge loan, and then Betty Dixon had issues galore. Uh, they must have, we must have completed the loan. Um, I don't remember how that ended up, but it must have. 
uh, and then paid the bank. Um, and Betty Dixon went out of business shortly thereafter. That's, I think, was used to build their building out of Winchester, wasn't it? Could be, yeah. Right across from Lexington Precision. Gee, Jerry Myers, remember Jerry? Oh yeah, he, he's still going. I was down there about a year ago. As a matter of fact, we've got brochures in our, on our table. They're having, they've got manufacturing seminars that they put on in just about every year. His son is pretty much taking over, but Jerry's still active with the business. And then uh, EZ Modular Offer System. Uh, Zerbst, remember Eula Zerbst, she, it was her, she, and Norm, Eula and Norm Zerbst. Oh, now the moratorium, was that the same time that the apartment, was that a moratorium, JDA moratorium, was it an IDA moratorium, was it a legislative moratorium, do you remember? Yeah. That's the time when we were having the conflicts with the controller, the county controller and everything. And the, I think it was a combination of a lot of factors. The board wanted to, you know, stop everything until it was all straightened out. So essentially that was the moratorium and then there was the debate. So essentially we were out of business on the LTEC for Four. three years. Gosh. Just about. It looks like we, the, the, well, even more that. Well, time. yeah, because 98 is when we. So, 90, yeah, 91 through 97. Yeah. Gosh, I forget about that. So, you think about that we were, we were down. We were out of business. Then the first one was 98. So, lack. So for between 1990 and 98, there were no loans out of the Altec fund. Correct. And those must have been exceptions, both Crawford. I remember Crawford. Remember, uh, was it Carl Kappa needed $300,000, and that was sort of an emergency deal. And if you look, basically 97 is when uh, Parmit got the state to allocate the 6.5 million. So I think as part of that, uh, Parliament was insisting that we come up with definitive guidelines. Thus it was approved by the board on May 27th, 1997. Right. And we had to do that to submit Bill's department needed the guidelines to submit for the repackaging. The and uh, the uh, the uh, Kavanoke and Cook came out in '98. Huh? This is interesting. Uh, and our really our first loan was the next page, Tirana, in October of '98. We talked about that today. Victor. Well. Actually, we had one Chautauqua Waterway Tours, which is Chautauqua, well, no, they can't be the Chautauqua Bell. No, I don't know what that was. In Crawford Manufacturing in March of 98. Yep. I remember that was a special kind of an emergency loan. Um, so yeah, we, we didn't do much, the real bottom line is. And then uh, going into the next page with 98. And when you look at that, Lori, it, all of those loans were manufacturing loans. You think about, this is 20 years ago. Our, though we had a policy which permitted commercial and retail the exceptions, but we just, as a policy, never got into that early on. No, no, we were pretty much specifically manufactured. I, I'm looking at that whole page uh, other than um, the 
the main express travel plaza, which is, remember that? Was, that was, was oh, that? yeah. Ed, <laughs> Ed, uh, Edward Martini. Oh, my gosh. Where, where's the that on the... That's uh, near toward the bottom uh, under Green Acres. Green Acres Enterprises. What was the date? 430.03. Oh, 430, oh, 430, oh, three. oh, okay. 430.03. Oh, gotcha. So that was Green Acres, which was now a unique travel destination. Uh, then Yaw Oil, I think that was the McDonald's closet. Yes, it was. It was McDonald's Aeromart or whatever that is out there. But if, if you go back, we, I think this is noteworthy. Uh, back in 2001, November of 2001, we did Star Hotels, the Best Western Inn and Suites, yeah. which is right across the street. But um, prior to that, we did do loans or help out uh, oh, the Holiday Inn in Jamestown mm. way back when. I mean, that was early 70s. And we also did... And, just to even it out, we did the Clarion over in Dunkirk, right. which was a Sheridan at the time we did it. So we kind of made it, we're making an exception for sort of the we did it hotel. One each for the North County and for the South County back in those days. And then we stayed out of it until 2001. And the next page starts with Max Hometown Market. Correct. And I remember that. That was one of my loans. And we, that's where we sort of strayed away as well because we uh, had the town board basically issue a resolution asking, you know, this was needed because they either had to go to Mayville or to Erie, you know, so it was a real necessity, you know, to, to do this. Important to the community. Located where? Sherman. Chautauqua Utilities, uh, that was another one that I did with the Remaults. That was to put a gas pipeline from right around Bosey's up through Stowe, just about to Chautauqua, to tie all that in to existing lines. Still, and that, so that loan is still open, right? It's oh yeah, yeah. They get moratoriums or ask for them all the time because. They were doing it because there was a hotel project there in Stowe that a developer from Warren was going to do, and they thought that would be their, you know, golden egg, but it never materialized. And, and people weren't as quick or as eager to sign up or have uh, their homes connected. So I assume a lot of them are still on propane. Yeah. I remember uh, the Resource Center, I don't know if that was a real estate one, I must, I'm trying to think, um, that may have been one of our first not-for-profits. Uh, uh, I'm not exactly sure what that was for. We did a bond financing before them. Yeah, and I'm not sure. Sure, if that, I mean, it's listed here as the Resource Center or if it was Allied Industries. Probably Allied Industries. Yeah, I, would I think it was. Yeah. You're right. Um, tourism, I see Merritt Estates Winery. Um, 
That's when we, well, we had been getting into uh, wineries or agribusiness, you know, all along because we had loans or some kind of uh, dealings with Chadwick Bay mm -hmm. Winery, which has since gone out of business, uh, Woodbury which I don't think is listed anywhere on here, but we did business with them if they were CRLFs. True. Um, Tordella and Palm, was that, were they making, manufacturing anything at that time, or was that a, uh, a commercial enterprise? I mean, they did have a commercial location that's when the, that's when they moved or tried to do something in Lakewood in the I think it was the old quality plaza mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the quality store there and uh, ba that basically went south the father or the son ended up running it and the father you know was pretty distressed about the way he was running it and I think that was a, a failed loan, or partially. I think it was a partially, you're right. Pacific Sterling, I don't recall that. Pacific Sterling? It's uh, 82107, 82107. Oh, that was, I believe that was my buddy Hank Ranger. That was uh, going in the old Ferrani Packard building ah, over okay. in Dunkirk. Okay. okay. Uh, again, now a couple of these are Can Am, which is Radisson, Keebler, Peak and Peak. Uh, so we started to get a little bit more involved in the tourism destination business. Yeah, Genesee Outfitters was a put through as a tourism destination uh, project as well because right, sure. they were going to be Orvis outfitters. Correct, correct. I'm turning the page. It's just, it's interesting. This is fascinating. As <coughs> we're getting a little bit, the mix is still industrial manufacturing sites when you look at what we're doing, but then all of a sudden you got the Moldowney development, which is essentially real estate Correct. Uh, development project. So was Maidem, yeah, just Maidem. above it. It Maidem, that's what you forgot about that. Uh, then we had Tourism Paradise Yacht Cruise. That's the talk uh Wind, struck a wind. Wind. Yeah. I think we got paid so, off that. I think we got paid off. Um, Bloomquist Landscaping, which is a, I don't know if they manufacture anything, it's really, again, a somewhat of a commercial establishment, mixed bag. Um, Muldowney again. Um, McDiarmid was SKF for a developer that helped SKF expand. Rainbow Parrot. Rainbow Parrot. That's We Want You Cottages. Okay. So again, tourism it's destination. Basically to put in a pool, a pool building. Flipping the page here. And you can see there are a couple more R-Tone uh, loans there. That right. So we've definitely helped them grow into what they are today. Yeah, look at the size of them. Right yeah, somewhere. how they increase from less than 100 to 400, half a million. And there's Agro-America, 2011, $136,000 on 8-23-2011. I probably started five years earlier. <laughs> and then they paid it off. Um, going to the next page here, 
CBJ Credit Recovery. You think about that's a service industry. Mm -hmm. Scotts, of course, is a tourism destination. Um, East Main Complex. That's really that wasn't that Muldowney. No, no, that's the old Fredonia Seed Building oh, yes, in Fredonia. So that I forgot the names. Yep, he there. The one guy, Brunello or something like that. One died. The older guy right, died. Right, Stunello. Stunello. Yeah. Um, but that's a real estate development project. Then CBJ CBJ J is a service industry. Ram Ventures. That is is that uh, uh, what's his name White with uh, that has Dahlstrom's now. Rob White with Roll. Could we? Or Roll Form. Yep, that that sounds about right. Again. Uh, though manufacturing, uh, Grand Ventures was a real estate development. Uh, MMM is probably Mold Downey again. MMM, that is uh, basically over in Silver Creek, the Barillos. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> a cousin or something of. Uh, Beekner, that's a service industry. Correct. Counteract. The out and climber. That's an industry or? Yeah, it's fabrication. fabrication. Yep. Uh, Reverie is a man of food industry. Correct. Boxwood Hotel. Jack's Repair is a service industry. Brick City is a restaurant. Scott's Peak and Peak service. Advanced Production. Group that's they had bought the uh, the former Dunkirk Metal okay, okay. plant over in Dunkirk when they moved to our spec building. Okay. Um, in tube fabrication company is Sternello again. That East Main complex. So it's interesting through 2015, and it's probably gotten. The mix has gotten even greater as far as away from industrial or manual. Oh yeah. Well, I'll as I was getting into it, I'll have to pass this on. You know, if somebody wants to keep it, you know, going. Right. Well, it's fantastic work. Lord. Still, but it's uh, it's just this. I didn't appreciate how it sort of worked its way through a mix over time from principally manufacturing to now a mix of service industry, uh, commercial. Hmm. All right, let's talk about board directors. Um, I didn't have a chance. You came in 85. Yep. So, you and the people that were here were Tom Reed, Paul Sandberg, Fred Heft, Paul Benke, John Cook, and Chuck Turcott. And John Cook was a Cook Brewing, right? They sold. Yes. Public. Yep. Paul Benke was obviously Jamestown Community College. Fred Heft, I believe, was a retired uh, Altel or executive, mm -hmm. or in the telecommunications. Tom Reed had Dunker Radiator. And Chuck Turcott at the time was head of the Manufacturers Association. And Dr. Duino was there as well. 
Yes. And his he was what a school administrator? Yeah, he was I believe superintendent of Fredonia. And some of the other guys, we might as well just while we're going at it, see if we can identify what these guys were. Weidman. Jim Weidman. He was with Welch back in the day. Welch Foods when it was still in Westfield. And Don McPhee. President of J or Fredonia. Carl Little. Uh, president of Weber Knapp. Uh, Jim Kaflish. He was on the, the legislature. Dallas Beal. He was president of Fredonia, Sonny Fredonia. Gene Balin. Gene Balin was, he was I think with Red Wing over in Fredonia. Bill Raines? Bill Raines was here very briefly. He was Dunkirk Metal. If I call, we call correctly, Bill was here for a short period of time and then his company was a recipient of a loan and he had to get off the board. It could have been, yeah. Uh, Joe Budzinski? I'm not sure he was a Dunkirk Fredonia area, but I'm not sure what company he was associated with. I think Joe was with uh, Red Wing. Okay. Uh, Jane Fagerstrom. She was legislature. Leon Baito. Legislator. Nancy Barger. Legislator. Jack Alange. <coughs> no idea. Dunkirk. But he was in Dunkirk, yeah. Uh, he had relation in Jamestown, and I went to school with, but uh, I'm not sure his business. Heidi Nolo? She at the time was right across the street there. She was running RQ. Uh, the RQ group, I guess it was. Quinn Anderson's daughter. Maria Kinberg. Legislator. Joe Johnson. Joe Johnson at the time of this was with Chautauqua Institution. He was vice president of finance or. Uh, Bob, Bob Barber. Barber. He was, I think he retired from JCC while he was here with, on the board here. Frank? Coupon clipper. <laughs> he, he was a real estate developer yeah. for a while and uh, owned Sonny's, which was a good bar over in Fredonia. That's it, he was yeah. a bar, uh, So basically a real estate developer. Yeah. Uh, and now chairman of the board of uh, Chautauqua, or actually Fredonia College. Yeah. Mike Metzger, when he joined us, was. He was with. Yeah. Oh, what year was that? 99? He was with Accurite, or, uh, yeah, Accurite. Uh, Zot? He was a legislator. Charles Cornell? A legislator. Richard Starr? He was with Cliff Starr, a vice president of some And he was Stanley's son. Sean Heenan. Legislator. Jerry Park. Legislator. Mike Piazza. Mike Piazza was the first real labor guy. That, well, aside from Joe Mason, one of the founding members. Uh, that's when we tried to switch back to have a labor representative on the board. Mm -hmm. And while well, Mike was a longtime member and he became chair. Gosh. SKF, right? Yes, he was a MRC at the time, but yeah, SKF. Dave Madanowski. Yeah. He was with one of the food processors over in 
Dunkirk or Fredonia. There was a guy I thought was from CPS. The, Dave was from CPS, you're right. right yep. Uh, of course, Greg Desincu. JCC president. Dennis Rack. Who's still on the board. Uh, he got off for a little while. Uh, forget, he owns his own business. Yeah, it's a double, double something vineyard. Vineyards. Fred Crosscut. He was originally on as a legislator, and then he was on as a normal board member. Agribusiness. Yes. Doreen Sixby. She was an officer, a vice president with uh, m and Bank. Uh, David Bryant? He was a consultant. He used a former uh, professor at Sunny Fredonia, former owner of the White Inn in Fredonia, and then a consultant. And George Barillo? He was a legislator and uh, now county executive. By the way, I think is it, and I get this wrong, kids, but is it double R's on that? Probably. Yeah, just, uh, I, I, I made the mistake, and I don't know how, which way I ended up looking at No, I up. think you're right, Borello. Yeah, right. My wife corrects me in how I pronounce it, how I do everything. So, anyways, this, the board members would love to see this. I'm sure, you know, maybe that's something to have at the next. Yeah. Fun. And this I have passed on to Sue so she can keep it updated. Yeah. And the current board members, Brad Walters, which in keeping with a union rep or some kind of labor rep, you know, that's I'm sure what the board or the county executive was thinking. And that's Southern Tier Builders. Correct. Is Kelly the director? Is Kelly Farrell Du Bois. Is is she president of Hopes? Yeah. Gary Henry. Gary Henry is uh, basically the well president of Fancher Chair in Faulkner. Hans Auer. Hans Auer is with UPS. Uh, UBS. Finance, financial consultants. Kim Peterson? Kim Peterson's a retired uh, general manager or president of. Uh, oh, gee. What is the door company right on Main Street? In the, Allison Bronze. Dennis Rack, we went over. And Mark O'Dell is the legislator ex-officio legislature. And the one we, just, we missed is Corey Duckworth. Oh yeah, president of JCC. And, uh, soon to soon to be uh, retired. retired. Wow, this is unbelievable pulling this together. What is interesting, you know, just uh, We've been at this since 72, so that makes it 46 years, and there's only been six administrative directors during that time period, with the seventh, there is a seventh, technically, I think, the guy that preceded David, who we can never remember his name. It's in the minute books, which I meant to ask you. I brought some minute books, the most recent minute books, over from from uh, Riverside, but they're they're still, you know, that whole big bookcase is still full of those books. They should probably be safeguarded someplace. Yeah, for the history of it all, it's a yeah. thing. I mean, now we, we have the space in the basement, so they should come up here. it's out of sight, out of mind, I guess, yeah. but. I mean, just uh, fascinating. You did a great job. Wow. Well, 
What else? A lot of this was done when we did the 40-year Altec reunion. <coughs> yeah, we were trying to find These somebody. Were still yeah, alive. exactly. Uh, Tom couldn't make it. Jim Mead, we were led to believe, is still among us, but uh, just couldn't quite nail him down. Uh, Turcotte. J I don't know. I just, I've never, unless he moved. It, the last I think I heard that he was living with his daughter. But if her daughter's still in this area, or if his daughter's still in this area, I'm not sure. Gosh, you know, my paths just haven't crossed his at all. Um, and he lived on Spanish, or the Span not Spanish gates. Um, right up of Hunt Road. Yeah. Yeah. Which looks like a Spanish. Yeah. Uh, Cap Circle. Uh, Jim Weidman has passed away, and uh, Ann, I see her. Uh, Rocky just passed away. Carol Little, I see Carl. Catfish is still around. Balin, I think, has passed away. Bill Raines, I haven't seen. Budzinski, I think, died. Uh, Fagerstrom passed away. I see Bob Barber every once in a while. Of course, Joe Johnson, uh, Maria, F even Frank. I haven't seen. He's around, but I haven't seen him. He's not in that world. I think Richard Starr is now in South someplace. Mm -hmm. Jerry Park, I think, passed away. Um, Mike, you still alive? As far as, yeah, as far as I know, still on Peter Swanson Road. Yeah. Well, this is a whole bit of my life, too. Thank you for doing all of this. No problem. Yeah, you find the old, have you always been interested in the history? I found the older I've gotten, the more interested I am becoming <clears throat> history. Well, there's, and, and this place has had a lot of history with a lot of businesses. I mean, when you think about that list, uh, we, and bef before that, even with the bond, this is just the LTEC. Yes, yep. Yeah, this has nothing to do with the industrial revenue bonds. Correct. With the big ticket items. Uh, I don't know, that you, we ever did a list of that, did we, of the IRBs? Not historical. I mean, obviously, for reporting purposes, we have to yearly do a report. But uh, no, and that's another thing. Well, all the bond books, you've returned some of to us to see if we want them. But well, they take they up look good on a shelf. But they look great on a shelf, but they take <laughs> up a lot of room. Uh, and that's probably, I'm sure, the someplace there's an audit trail because our annual reports have to show them. Uh, but as far as the IDA touching the big deals in town, we touched everybody. And it was really active when I, uh, you know, back in the 70s, 80s. To me, that was really the golden era when Hopkins, oh, yeah. Bellafield, yeah came in, they did all those bond issues, Sandberg and those guys would be in New York City for days on end. Uh, a lot of funny stories about that, <laughs> you know, the Sandberg just, I, you know, saying, oh, look, at, I'm going, I'm flying back, if anybody needs my signature, I'll be in a limo. <laughs> guys all of a sudden scrambled in the limo while Paul is signing on yeah. back to the airport. Uh, you know, so that, that's a kind of, if you ever got an intern, just to be able to, to list that. I mean, I think it would be very impressive. I know the biggest, because I do the uh, IRB reporting, is into the pair system. The biggest that I've ever seen is the NRG for 58.5 million. Right. And that's paid now, right? No. Still no, up. it's okay. still, as a matter of fact, the way it's written, I found out this past January was, uh, it doesn't mature until 
immature, so they aren't paying it down at all either. Mm. But that was for their uh, basically regasification process over at Dunkirk. But I, good things are going to be happening there, I guess, too. <laughs>